Hi everyone, I'm Mathieu and I'm going to present today to you today IDL, um, and essentially a language defined intermediate representation for SSA compilers. Um, one point of IDL is also to be able to define those intermediate representations at runtime and we apply this to the MLI compiler. So first of all, let's talk a bit maybe about intermediate representation themselves. So if you look at like kind of old compilers, you start from your input language, so C or C++, and you compile it with a black box to, let's say, x86. So this is, of course, not that good because you have a huge abstraction gap be between your like first, I mean, first representation, uh, C, C++ to x86, you have like a whole different set of features, so that's not that really easy to write a compiler for it. So luckily, people made kind of intermediate representations for this. So for instance, you have MLIR, uh, LLVM IR, which is quite now good because your abstraction gap is way smaller, so it's way easier to write your compiler. This also allows you to essentially retarget other architectures such as ARM or RISC-5, and this also goes in the other way around, since now you can try to target LLVM IR from other languages like Swift. At the same, in the same way, you have now more modern languages that also have a high level intermediate representation for their own compiler, like Swift, or let's say Rust, or for any kind of academic DSL, you often found that you have like multiple level of abstractions for this. So essentially, kind of the idea is that we're getting more and more intermediate representations. If we're now looking at MLIR, which is a new compiler framework that is under the LLVM umbrella, this kind of looks like this. Essentially, instead of having kind of this linear pipeline, you have a huge kind of DAG of intermediate representation going from linear algebra down to, let's say, LLVMIR, or you could also have like a RIS-5 intermediate representation if you want. If you want to look, for instance, how TensorFlow is working, TensorFlow has something like this, where essentially you have different um, a level of abstraction that are working at the same time together. So essentially what you need to understand from this is the number of intermediate representations and also their size is currently kind of exploding. And the importance of intermediate representation is getting bigger and bigger in compilers. And if we look again in this MLIR compiler framework, we have around 30 different level of abstraction, or what's called dialect, which is kind of an intermediate representation. And these intermediate representation have around, like, in total, a thousand operations, which is kind of instructions, if you want, in what you would have in traditional compilers. So one of the reasons why this is happening is that whenever you want to create your own intermediate representation, Usually you would start by having your custom, you, I mean, you kind of your domain knowledge that you want to translate into this intermediate representation. And you would need to write a new data structures for your intermediate representation. You would need to write a parser. You need to write a printer. You would need to write some uh, pass manager, people optimizations, or again, that code elimination. Essentially you have a lot of things to re-implement. So the kind of the story about this MLIR project is instead of re-implementing this, we get it kind of for free. It's either auto-generated or it's reused. Well, that story is really nice, but in practice, in order to be able to have this, first you need to write a lot of boilerplate, or at least generate it. And this is essentially where IDL come from. The point of IDL is to be able to generate this, so then we can, you, I mean, essentially generate this from a high-level language, so then we can reuse all the, these nice features you have in like MLIR. So there's essentially four objectives in IDL. The first one is to be concise. If you want to define a new operation that just have two operands, one result, you should only have to specify this. You should remove the most boilerplate you can. The second uh, objective you have is you want it to be introspectable. You want to be able to look at the intermediate representation definitions because you might extract meaningful information from it or you might want to use it in external tools. The third objective you have is that you want it to be dynamic. So currently, the only way you can define new intermediate representations in MLIR is by essentially writing kind of C++ code for it and you need to compile it. By having essentially a way to define this at runtime, then we can use it for other features. We can, let's say, um, we can like generate new intermediate representations at runtime if they like change for each time to compile, for instance, et cetera. 
And lastly, you want it to be generable. You want to be able to generate new intermediate representations from either meta programming or from um, your different, um, let's say, from a specification of like an architecture, for instance. So how does this thing work? So when you have your compiler, you have your source language, you have your target language, and you have all of these intermediate representations in the middle. IDL comes as like a separate file that will generate those intermediate representations. Additionally, we can extend it with some C++ code to be able to represent arbitrary computation or like during complete intermediate representation that cannot be represented with kind of this declarative language. And hopefully, having this IDL definition language separate from this and also being introspectable and everything would help us essentially interacting with other tooling such like uh, an IR language server, for instance, or if we want to do IR refactoring, etc. So let's look at a simple example on how to define a dialect for, let's say, complex numbers for, um, for operations on complex numbers. So let's define our dialect. So as I said before, a dialect is essentially this kind of level of abstraction. And a dialect is just a name. And inside it, we'll first thing, the first thing we'll do is define a type, the type of what is a complex number. So we have a type, we define a set of parameters. So here we have, let's say, a complex number of f32 or a complex number of f64. So we define one thing called a constraint, which is this float type thing. I mean, we define a parameter using this constraint. And so essentially, whenever you want to create a complex type, you need to write this parameter, and this parameter needs to satisfy the predicate that is defined by this constraint. Here we don't define the, here this uh, constraint, the float type is built in, and essentially it's any floating points type. We can define aliases to make the code a bit more concise. So for instance, we define the alias for any complex, which represent um, a complex type that can have any parameter in it. And finally, we can define, let's say, a multiplication operation to multiply two complex numbers. So this one is a bit more complex. We define essentially two operands, LHS and RHS, which are both of type T, which I'll go a bit later. And then we define a result, rest, that also has this type T. This type T comes from what's called a constraint variable, which essentially says, oh, T needs to be in any complex. And also, all of the uses of T needs to be equal. So essentially, if you multiply two, com two complex of f32, they should give you a result of complex 32. Same if you had a complex f64, it should be f64. And you cannot, com like, let's say combine those, you cannot have multiplication between a complex f32 to a, to a complex of f64. Additionally, what you have is you have an assembly format or a way to print it and pass it in a nice way. And here we can define a custom one that has, let's say, Oh, whenever you print it, first print the left-hand side, then print the right-hand side, then print the complex type, and essentially print just the parameter of the complex type, because you know that everything needs to be a complex type. And that's it. You have a dialect for your complex number uh, representation. So as I said, we have, um, we have those constraints, and we describe them in the paper. But essentially, what you need to know is that there's only a few of them. And even there is only a few of them, we can represent most of the MLIR um, intermediate representations with it. So now, what we can do with this? So what I presented is essentially how to generate or how to like represent intermediate representation with a high-level language. But the fact that it's introspectable makes it also, I mean, makes other use cases that may be pretty interesting. So nowadays, we have multiple, essentially, tools that leaves uh, in essentially in a siloed way. So you have like compilers, you have SMT solvers, you have verification tools, but whenever you to make two interact between each other, let's say if you want to add an SMT solver to prove some facts about your compiler, usually what you have to do is to use a C++ interface that is not really used, I mean, it's not really easy to use, and also since now, um, or intermediate representation in special, I mean, so especially in MLIR, gets updated often and change a lot, well, the C++ interface might break a lot. So what I propose is that with this IDL, we can essentially use this to provide an interface between the compiler and any of these tools. By essentially having this declarative format that is easily introspectable, we can use this to interact with all the tooling. So we provide one example in our paper, which is essentially we translate the MLI dialects into our ideal representation, and then we use an automatic um, 
tool to just give some analysis on the dialects we currently have. So we have the results essentially in our paper, but the results are mostly how many operands are used, how many, what kind of constraints are used to represent operation and types, etc. So in conclusion, we presented an IDL, which is a language to define um, intermediate representation for SSA compiler that we applied for MLIR. We showed that this IDL can also be used to essentially provide a bridge between um, our compilers and other tooling, and we applied it to provide some um, nice statistics on the usage and I mean on the usage of uh, constraints, etc., on the definitions in the MLI of the MLI database. And thanks. Uh, you started with a slide with lots of examples of IRs in LLVM. Yeah. So have you gone and sort of systematically re-implemented all of those and then gone to the authors of the original IR and said, hey, this is cleaner and you're going to get all this additional functionality? And what kind of response did you get? So that's a really nice question. So first of all, we wanted to work with the community from the ground up. So essentially, we work with the community to kind of design this thing. So they already have what's called uh, ODS and TableGen, and we work with them to build kind of a better language for it, something that is a bit less hacky, I would say. And so what we did to translate these languages to IDL was kind of this semi-automatic translation, but we I made recently, again, a presentation for the MLIR uh, Open Developers Meeting to talk about this and then like to try to see if we can put them in uh, MLI for this to get it it's more adopted. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, so um, I wondered if you could quantify how much more concise your IR specifications have become thanks to your uh, uh, new language compared to how they were specified in in say MLI uh, originally. Mm. So the I don't really have a way to quantify this. I can just say it's like a bit of a feeling over this, and it feels better. But I'm a bit biased for this. So I don't really have a way to exactly quantify this. But essentially, we just provide a small set of constraints that is enough to represent everything. But currently in MLIR, if you want to use those constraints, you need to write C++ for it. And it gets ugly quite fast if you want to look like how things are actually defined in practice. What are SSA compilers? How are they different from compilers described in the Dragon Book compilers? I would love to have some quick down-to-earth uh, explanation. Oh, so I didn't do my homework and I actually haven't read the Dragon compiler. But <laughs> essentially, SSA compilers are essentially compilers when you have operation and operation defined variables and a variable cannot be assigned twice. That's kind of the main idea. So what we presented here was applied for SSA compilers but we could also use this for like, um, let's say, um, uh, C of nodes compilers, for instance. But they kind of defer to how you would, of some academics would define compilers using tree-based uh, structures. So it, it looks like with that framework, I can very easily define the syntax of my language and the operations. Um, but then to write a compiler or to do analysis or verification or anything, I also care a lot about the semantics of these operations. And I find working with LVM that's often fairly unclear. So, like, does do you think a framework like this can also help to write more clearly and document more clearly, or maybe implement more clearly mm -hmm. what all the semantics of these operations are, how they affect analysis, how how I would what I would have to do to prove my program does the correct thing when using these on all of these semantic concerns? Okay, that's a really nice question. So, essentially, yes. In currently MLIR semantics are a bit unclear, as it is with LLVM. But hopefully, you could imagine ways of kind of adding semantics using this IDL thing. So you would have your IDL file, and then in this IDL file, you add of, I mean, you would need to write it, of course, but kind of specify semantics of your operations additionally in the IDL file to then have the semantics linked with your current operation types, etc. The only problem, so this paper only describes how to define dialects, but they never, I mean, we don't specify how like, we actually do transformations on it. And this is like a much complex, uh, also a much complex problem. Uh, so I have a question. So for uh, your your IR, is it written on top of table gen? So it's something that's at compile time, or you define the operation types at runtime? Because you mentioned you do this at runtime, but then yes. 
so great question. So essentially, we can do it in kind of two ways. You can either generate C++ or generate table gen from IIDL, or you can also register it at runtime. So there's a bit of exceptions in this. Uh, if you do this, then we need to make sure, I mean, there's only a subset that can be represented at runtime. So if you use what I explained with this kind of C++ extension, it doesn't work. But for most uh, operation types, et cetera, in MLIR, you could actually register them at runtime. And we work with the community to add this like runtime support in MLIR. Okay, we have one last question from Slack. Uh, thanks, great work. Can you explain how, how IRDL is different from the MLIR declarative language that's used for defining new dialects? Yes, so essentially, so just a bit of context. So MLIR currently has a way of generating the C++ as well, but using, uh, let's say, much less um, kind of formal language, uh, which is called like table gen. And essentially the way we differ from it is that we identified um, what kind of constructs are actually used in practice with this ODS language, and then we extract it to like a proper language that we can then use. So ODS is essentially generating C++, I mean, is a way of writing uh, kind of macros to generate C++, when in all case we have a language that we can then like compile down to like C++. Yeah. Thanks a lot.